Good evening and welcome. Thank you all so much for being here for Critical Intersections, Gender, Power, and Conflict. We are so thrilled on behalf of the Center for the Study of Gender and Conflict and George Mason University School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Uh, let me be the first to welcome you formally for the evening keynote speaker. My name is Elizabeth Dakey Mount, and I'm the Executive Director for the Center for Study of Gender and Conflict. Uh, I'm going to be introducing our dean here in just a moment, but I wanted to take a quick moment to tell you a bit about the center. Um, I know some of you have traveled from far and wide to be here, and we're thrilled to have you. Uh, the center was founded formally in 2012 in November. Uh, it was built out of a 10-year engagement on issues of gender and conflict here at this school um, that had started really with the beginning of our dear Sandra Sheldon coming uh, to the university and kicking off our gender and conflict class. We had a number of faculty and students that went into practice and did research together. Uh, we've had two edited volumes come out of the work that's been done over the past 15 years now at SCAR related to gender and conflict, and uh, now this is our third annual conference. Um, so we're so thrilled to have you here. We're hoping that this is just the start of many, many fun uh, collaborations, fruitful talks that we have with you. Uh, we hope that you'll be engaged with us on the internet through Facebook, through Twitter, through social media. After you uh, leave, we hope that you'll come back next year. And uh, in the meantime, I hope that for tomorrow you enjoy all of the panels, and for tonight, uh, that you'll enjoy our keynote with Dr. Cynthia Enlow. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Kevin Averick, uh, the Dean of the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Thank you, Elizabeth. Is, is this thing working? Can you hear me? Great, thank you. So it's um, a, a pleasure and, and, and an honor to welcome Cynthia Enlow to, to SCAR, and I want to thank the Center for Gender and Conflict for, for doing so, for organizing the conference, and for in inviting me to do the, the formal welcome. Uh, the formal welcome by a dean is most often and most often appropriately purely ritualistic, um, but I want to make it a little bit more than that because, in fact, I have long admired Cynthia Enlow's work, uh, dating back to the first of it that I read in 1973, a work called Ethnic Conflict and Political Development, not the subject of this conference, and which in fact expanded on earlier work and generalized work on ethnicity and development and conflict that um, she reported on in a work on uh, multi-ethnic politics and it focused on Malaysia that was published, I think, in 69 or 1970. Now, let me, I'll just say a word about why this was important and why I, as a cultural anthropologist, uh, read, this, read this work. It was because Professor Enlow was among the first of a generation, particularly of political scientists, who recognized that what was then you know, called e ethnicity, uh, race, religion, ling linguistic affiliation, essentially identities, we're, we're not going to be washed away in a tide of modernization, which really meant westernization, that many social scientists, but particularly economists and political scientists, believe to be inevitable that in the 60s, the world was changing and it was going to become much more like Muncie, Indiana. Um, in fact, my favorite uh, and there are lots of, lots of examples by some eminent people, but my favorite is one of the earliest examples, and that was Daniel Lerner's, and just listen to the title, The Passing of Traditional Society, right? published in 1958, in which he said, these traditional societies are going to pass. They're going to be more like us. And among his samples were Iran, Lebanon, and Egypt. I can think of fewer occupations than social science or punditry where you can be so wrong in your predictions and maintain a sterling academic reputation. Maybe TV, maybe TV weather forecasters. Yeah. Um, but, but more than that, more, more than being among the first to look at the post-colonial world and not talk about modernization but talk about identity, more than this, and what made that book special was that it linked identity politics 
specifically to post-colonial development issues. And this linkage was particularly insightful since the dominant model then, and alas, <laughs> the dominant model today, is the neoliberal model of development, what, what was called back then, Walt Rostow called it, stages of economic growth. Uh, and that was particularly championed by economists and political scientists. And today it's called globalization, and that neoliberal penetration is sometimes, to my chagrin, called peace building, which is not what we mean by it. Now, but OK, that's, that's enough about how early I was an admirer of Cynthia Ellen's work. Obviously, what she is chiefly known for, of course, is her lifetime of critical work in feminist theory and her critique of sexism and militarism, and importantly, her critique of international relations. And you know what the, what the crucial titles are, Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, Does Khaki Become You? More recently, Globalization and uh, Militarism. You, you know all this. But what I want to focus, reflect on briefly, is in how I connect this work, because I'm not a feminist theorist, as my students can attest, how I connect this work to, the, to my field, to the field that I grew into from being a cultural anthropologist, the field of conflict analysis and resolution, but really the field of peace and conflict studies more, more generally. In an essay I wrote a couple years ago now, before I became dean and I was able to write essays, essentially, um, I, I described my sense of the evolution of my field and in it, I, I referred in passing to Cynthia Enlo as a fellow traveler. And let me tell you and let me tell her why I did so and what I meant. Uh, conflict analysis and resolution, or peace and conflict studies, has several roots in several social science disciplines and social practices. But certainly a key one, a key one of our roots particularly around the work of violence and war, lay in, in international relations. And many scholars from IR came to the field and helped to populate it. Now, many people have observed, I'm surely not the first, that in looking back at the history of IR, the kind of institutional history of IR, it emerged directly after the carnage of World War I, right? And it was conceived as a discipline devoted to the scientific ways to prevent further wars and to support peace. But as Joe Heller famously said in one of his novels, something happened in the 30s. And then, of course, after the carnage of the Second World War. And what happened was that the original conception of the discipline, and indeed the original conception of the, of the enterprise, was derided as idealism. And it was replaced by hard-headed realism, and by game theory, and by RCT, and by theories of deterrence, and eventually by mutual assured destruction, and by work done famously at the Hudson Institute that talked about survivability of a thermonuclear war and how we could rationally do this, we could strategize. Now, in many, many ways, I view peace and conflict studies as the IR that might have been had it, had it not been, been hijacked. And the reason for this is that peace and conflict studies offers a radically different perspective on peace and on war and on violence. And obviously, you don't want a 14-week course, but I can do it in simple terms, what peace conflict studies is about. It's about the rejection of the realist notion that if you want peace, prepare for war. You just you start with rejecting that, and you work outward and more deeply from that. Now, what does all this have to do with Cynthia Enloe's work? Why, why a fellow traveler from a non-feminist theory? It's because Professor Enlow, very early on, was doing a form of cultural study in which he pointed out the essentially gendered conception of traditional uh, IR. 
not, not, not just the sexism in the discipline, but the essentially gendered conception of it. Although she might admit that no one captured it as well or as succinctly as Helen Caldicott when she talked about miscellany and the dynamics. More, more broadly, of course, all feminist theory, from whatever feminist discipline, provides a critical and alternate discourse for understanding society, culture, and polity. A different way of conceiving peace, for example, as something requiring more social justice and fewer warheads. And of course, on the practice, on the praxis side of it, of pointing out the costs to women, to children, and also to men of an increasingly militarized world. So it is, it is this commitment which is central to feminist theorizing. It is this commitment to an alternative discourse and a radically different conception of how to treat violence and war that my field shares with feminism more generally. And the way I know that is because we are derided by the same critics. And we're derided by being called wishy-washy, idealistic, naive, or the one I love best, soft. And where is Helen Caldicott when we really need her? These are gendered put-downs that are directed to our field, regardless of the gender of the researcher or teacher or theorist who confronts you know, the security studies people. And it's in this way and for these reasons that I am a great admirer, an early admirer, and a great admirer of Cynthia Enloe's work, and I welcome her to ESCO. Thank you very much. Thank you. Also, it's a very is interesting institutional history you, you just got, right? So that we, we got a, a double, you know, espresso there. Yeah. Um, it's great to be at George Mason. Um, it's wonderful to be uh, hosted by the Gender and Conflict Center, um, and it's terrific. I've already spent this afternoon listening to some wonderful. Uh, papers presented by the graduate student presenters who have come to the conference, and I'm going to be around to hear more of them tomorrow. So I always think the best of all worlds is when you're invited to blah, blah, but in fact what you do is learn. That's the best. So this is the best kind of setting uh, to be in. I'm just delighted. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, both um, Alice Peck and Lisa McLean. They're the people who got me here. It takes a village, um, and I know they had a lot of, of teammates uh, that helped them put this on, but it really is a huge, it's a huge effort to get us all in the same room at the same time um, is really an achievement. I thought tonight what I might talk about is something that out there, well, not in the ether, it's amongst very specific people, um, is a cause for some worry um, this week, last week, and the week before, I mean very specifically. Um, and it comes out of two very specific conferences um, that were recently held. One was sponsored by the Dutch government, um, and it was in Amsterdam about four weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, and, um, and it was on the Dutch um, 1325, that's the UN resolution on women, peace, and security. And every um, government is supposed to create their own national action plan to implement 1325 in their own operations. It's very controversial. It happens one country at a time. It's very different in every country. And if there's any country you're either from or you're doing work in, find out whether there's any move afoot uh, to have a 1325 national action plan 
in that country and figure out what the politics are um, and which uh, feminist groups are being X'd out and which feminist groups are being brought in and what's the consequence of it. So this was the Dutch version of that. And um, as many of you know, the Dutch government, uh, whichever party's in power, imagines themselves to be kind of ahead of the curve um, and um, so had really quite deliberately brought a lot of feminist NGOs into the plan um, discussions. But they also brought the women activists, particularly feminist activists, um, as well as men who are doing gender equity activism in those countries, from the countries that the Netherlands particularly sees itself as investing time, effort, and personnel in um, peace building uh, programs. And that's Burundi. So these are who were there. They were, they were um, feminist activists from Burundi, from Sudan, Somalia, Congo, and one more country. It'll come to me. Um, so it was a mix of Dutch activists and activists from uh, those countries that the Netherlands government sees itself as feeling particularly responsible for um, peace building uh, activism um, to think about what should the National Action Plan of the Netherlands be? So a very interesting conference. Now, it, it was held in a great big building in Amsterdam, beautiful old building that used to be the Stock Exchange. Um, and so this is a better use for uh, Stock Exchange building. Um, but of course, the Dutch are very heavily into international finance, so it's not as if the Dutch don't do stock exchanges anymore. Um, but it was a very big building. It was a building that was big enough to have two conferences going on side by side simultaneously. Now, the Dutch government was very proud of the fact that it had this National Action Plan for 1325, essentially feminist conference going on that was supposed to advise the Dutch government on how to do it better, right? But at the same time, in other rooms in the same building, they had deliberately planned, I mean, this was quite, it wasn't by accident, the Dutch Defense Ministry was holding their annual European Union peace operations, not to be confused with keeping, peace operations conference where all the European peace operations policymakers would come together in the same building. And the idea was that there would be a influence, a confluence between the two. But they made a big mistake because as we, which were about 80% women, um, walked around the upper galleries from our pickup sandwich lunch, standing at tables, you know those kind of tables you see in airports and things where you kind of, six of you huddle around a tiny little sandwiches. All very good, very nice, good conversations, you know, the way feminists do things. But we walked around the gallery and we looked at, this wasn't planned, we looked down and we saw the peace operations people having their lunch. <laughs> a story below. And there were about a hundred people, all dark suits. They were sitting down. They were having wine. They seem to be having full meals. But the thing is, it was perfect. So here were the feminists walking around the upper galleries having had our sandwiches, looking down at, though not you know, able to look down at, if you will, but physically looking down at what the peace operations people were having. It was masculinized, and they sat down with wine. The thing is that neither of these conferences actually influenced the other. But in our conference, one of the main new themes that was brought by um, activists and grassroots organizers from a number of different organizations was a concern with masculinities. And this was considered really one of the, if you will, hot new topics in the area of peace building and conflict resolution 
that is to take seriously masculinities. Now, you all know that, in fact, this has been bubbling up for some time, that in the area of gender research, in fact, there's been a quite a long, but not that long, quite a long time interest in the research on and the investigation on and the policy making, taking consideration of masculinities plural. So let me just put that out there, that that was one of the, really one of the most interesting prominent themes in the, if you will, the feminist informed conference that was going on in Amsterdam. And it was noted. Then last week and the week before, as some of you who follow the UN know, was the um, Council on um, the Council for the Status of Women, CSW, which is held every year. But this year was one of the biggest meetings of the CSW in New York, and it brought together thousands, literally thousands, of feminist activists from around the world. And it was considered to be kind of a substitute for a Beijing revisited. So it was very big. It was over 6,000 grassroots activists converged on New York to try and pressure the United Nations to actually take seriously um, their failings in implementing 1325 and all the resolutions that have followed on to 1325. So there was a very much an activist agenda, but there were also many panels all around the city organized by grassroots organizations. And one of the themes there that people noted was discussions, panels on, if you will, discussions of masculinities. Now, why does this make some feminists nervous? And that's what I really want to broach tonight. And I'm going to give you an instance of it, of something that is really just breaking now as an example. But in the back channels, if you will, in the hallways, over double espressos, um, there was a lot of worry voiced about, is masculinities now going to trump any genuine interest in taking women seriously? Is this going to be kind of the new serious project by which you can get funding? Is this going to be now the new project that will get you a seat at the table? Is this now, do you have to show that you are doing work on masculinities in order to be quote unquote taken seriously in fields and corridors of policy making? And that is a worry. As you know, those of you who have um, histories within academic life, as you know, women's studies started out as women's studies, except at Stanford where it was originally called and still is called feminist studies. But for the most, place, for the most part, it's called women's studies. Now, increasingly, Leslie's smiling, she knows this, now increasingly, this happened in the mid-90s, and by now it's really quite common. Many programs that started out as women's studies are now called women's and gender studies. What's it called here at George Mason in the undergraduate program? Women and gender studies. Women and gender studies. Do you know when it was changed? Or was it founded late and therefore adopted the women and gender studies model when it was founded? Gender was added probably in the last year or two. Got it. So do a history of thinking at George Mason. But this is true in many, many schools. Now, the reason that gender was added and was, well, there were two different kinds of reasons, one of which is very encouraging and the other of which is very worrisome. The encouraging is that feminist studies were always interested in both the politics of masculinities and the politics of femininities, but in fact, were specifically making an argument that you had to take women's lives seriously in order to understand either. The more worrisome justification for, quote, adding gender was to somehow 
make comment that just being interested in women's diverse, complicated, hard to get a grasp on lives was simply not enough. It really wasn't intellectually serious enough. If you added gender, it would appear more like a discipline. That's the worrisome history. So take any university you know and love and don't love, take any academic institution you know anything about, and find out which of those rationales really is what motivated the change from women's studies to women's and gender studies, or if it's a brand new program, starting it as women and gender studies. The worry is that funders, and we had a discussion this afternoon on one of the panels about funding and how it's working out with Mexican grassroots women's groups. Funders can sometimes wa wag the dog, right? That is that because so many grassroots organizations are so underfunded, are so vulnerable economically, um, in fact, they must constantly pay attention to what funders are interested in, what funders take seriously, what funders find exciting, what funders think is the new thing on the block, and that insofar as masculinities have now caught the eye, this is the gendered politics of funders. All right? Whatever funder you're interested in, whether it be a government funder like the Dutch government, which is a big funder of grassroots organizations of women, or whether it be the Ford Foundation or Soros, whatever organization you're interested in, you can also do a gender analysis of what they find exciting, what they find interesting, what they feel will give them credit by funding. And the worry is that some of the funders, major funders now, find masculinities much more interesting. That's not something that feminists in and of itself find worrisome. What feminists find worrisome is if that is a deflection from taking seriously and being genuinely curious about the lived experiences of diverse women. See the difference? Which means you have to have your antennae out all the time to say, is the study of masculinities that's going on by your colleague, by yourself, by the organization that you're affiliated with, is the study or the projects for masculinity training that's going on, is it for the sake of deflecting interest from women's lives, or is it for the sake of underscoring the importance of taking women seriously? Which is it? Feminist studies start with the presumption that women are interesting. Not that women are angels, not that women are victims, not that women are always right, and certainly not that women are all sisters, but that women are interesting. They are worth listening to. They are worth paying attention to. They are worth devoting intellectual and monetary resources in trying to understand. Anything that dilutes that that says, well, women really aren't interesting enough, unless, in fact, you're also doing work on masculinities. That is an attempt to dilute, to take the teeth out of, if you will, the feminist intellectual and political project. Now, having said that, watch what is going on this week. Last week it started, this week, and it's going to go on now, well, we'll watch it, we will all watch it play out. What is going on now in Sweden? The Swedish government is now a social democratic government. They were just re-elected, it was a conservative government. I don't know, you probably don't watch Scandinavian politics very much, but there's a center-right government in Norway, whatever your, your 
stereotypes are of Scandinavia. You know, you have to pay attention. There's a center-right government in Norway. There's a center-right government in Denmark. There's a center-right government, or there was, in Sweden. And that's just changed over to a social democratic government. We think, oftentimes, of Sweden as well as the other Scandinavian countries, particularly Norway and Denmark, as being leaders in gender um, equality and, more importantly, gender equity. Right? Equity is about justice. Equality is about equivalence. Um, and the Scandinavian model is one that a lot of us imagine is something that the rest of us could only wish for. But that underestimates what, in fact, is going on in very particular Scandinavian countries. Right? Just like you don't lump all of Africa together and pretend that Kenya is Nigeria, you don't lump all of North Africa together and imagine that T Tunisia is Morocco, you'd never do that, would you? No, 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 right? You don't lump all of Southeast Asia together and imagine that Malaysia is Indonesia, would you ever? No, of course you wouldn't. That is, it's not that you know, but you're curious, right? It's not that you know, but you're curious. So in S Scandinavia now, the Swedish government has just moved, has just changed parties as a result of an election. Um, and the women's vote, but more importantly, the feminist vote, really scared the hell out of the left. Because the Swedish feminists started a new party. They started a feminist party. And they managed to win a seat, just one. That's enough to scare party leaders. <laughs> they managed to win a seat, a feminist party seat, in the European Parliament. We, and those elections came just six months before the Swedish national elections came. The only reason I know all this, because I was at the um, Nordic um, Feminist Forum last June, and as happens here, I'm glad to say, that when you visit, you get tutored, right? People try to bring you up to speed about where are you and what's going on here and what you have to know. So the Swedish feminists took me under their wing, and. In 10 days, they tutored me intensively about <laughs> Swedish um, uh, politics. The foreign minister under the social democratic government that's now newly elected is named Mar Margot, but the Swedes oftentimes pronounce the T, Margot, Margot um, Wallström, W-A-L-L-S-T-R-O-M, Margot Wallström. Remember her name. Margot Wallström has had a long diplomatic career. She's always come out of the Social Democrats, but she's been an international uh, diplomat. First, she's been a European commissioner for the EU. And secondly, she has been director of the UN office created under feminist pressure, a special office for um, monitoring gender-based violence in conflict. Those are the two offices she held, as well as being a longtime Social Democrat in party terms in Sweden. She now is the foreign minister of Sweden. Last week, she announced that, and this was her authority as minister, that her government would terminate a military trade agreement with Saudi Arabia. And she said that she was doing this on behalf of the government because Sweden had signed 1325, had signed CEDAW, had signed the UN Declaration of Human Rights, had signed the Arms Trades Treaty, the most, one of the most recent international treaties, and that Sweden, therefore, must live up to its international treaty obligations. And those obligations made it incumbent upon her as minister to terminate a military trade agreement with Saudi Arabia for two reasons. 
One, because Saudi Arabia is the second largest importer of weaponry in the world. And secondly, because Saudi Arabia government. Now, she was talking about governments. She wasn't talking about cultures. She was talking about governments. The Saudi Arabian government was not only a major arms importer, but the Saudi Arabian government had enacted and implemented policies that were flagrant violations of women's rights. And those were her grounds for cutting off a Swedish military aid agreement. Not all Swedish arms sales to Saudi Arabia, mind you. Name a big Swedish arms manufacturer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which two cars do you think of when you think of Swedish cars? Saab. 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 Saab is a major fighter plane producer. Saab is probably Sweden's largest military armaments producer. It's not the only one, but and Sweden is only number 12 in the world in arms exports. Who's number one, of course? <laughs> right? Who's number two? Russia. Russia. But Sweden is only number 12. But, and this is now listening to Swedish feminists who are very alarmed at Swedish militarism. Right? But per capita, they say, Sweden is one of the largest arms sellers in the world in terms, because it's a small population, in terms of per capita sales. So what they argue is that to have a feminist foreign policy of Sweden, you must take into account that Sweden's whole economy has been distorted by being coming so dependent on international arms sales. Now this really complicates, it should for all of us, the relationship between militarism and sexual equality or gender equality. There's no question that Sweden has now one of the best records of achievement by many measures, World Economic Forum measures, UNEDP measures, of promoting gender equality, of promoting it. But it's at the same time that Swedish militarism has been left unchallenged at an elite level until Margot Wallstrom comes along. So Margot Wallstrom makes this decision and causes, and this is what's going on right now, a furor in Swedish domestic politics. Two things. One, it has brought out of the woodwork all the different companies who have a stake in Swedish arms sales, including H&M, the big garment retailer. H&M is Swedish. H&M has come out against Margot Wallstrom now and her decision. They don't claim that they are selling so much camo that that's their <laughs> bottom line. What they, and this is how militarization of executives of a corporation works. In fact, they don't make any weaponry. But H&M feels, believes at the executive, analytical, corporate level that any jeopardizing of Sweden's armaments industry will in fact jeopardize them as clothing manufacturers globally. That's militarization. That's militarization of people who, to all intents and purposes, are very civilianized. The second thing that has been aimed at Margaret Wallstrom is that she is naive. And Kevin mentioned that phrase earlier. Naive, we all know from gender analysis, is a feminizing term. It's intended to feminize the person it's aimed at, whether the person is man or woman. It's intended in a patriarchal system to feminize 
the person who's claimed to be naive, and therefore, and this only works if you have patriarchy, and therefore just discredit them. If, if you can tell that you're not living in a patriarchal society or in a patriarchal microculture, if to be feminized does nothing to damage your authority, if it does nothing to damage your prestige, if it does nothing to damage the seriousness with which your ideas are taken. But insofar as any small group or any larger group or any society is patriarchal, to be called naive will be to feminize you, which in turn will undermine your authority. Right? Now, the Saudi government, for their part, has been outraged. So the Saudi government also is, so now we're talking about the Saudi monarchy here now. The Saudi government at its senior levels immediately withdrew the Saudi ambassador from Sweden as a slap on the wrist. They also, behind the scenes, expressed outrage that a woman could criticize the Saudi monarchy. Right? But the Swedish critics did not come back and defend her on those terms. The Saudi government also claimed that Wallstrom had made her policy based on her critique of Islam, which, mentioned, which came nowhere in her policy decision. She was making a policy on the grounds of state policy of Saudi Arabia and state decisions about arms imports. That's the only things that she mentioned. But they claimed that actually underneath was a subtext of disrespect for Islam. And on the grounds of that critique, they got the rest of the Gulf monarchies, except Oman. Makes you very interested in Oman. I mean, it really does make you interested in Oman. Um, except for Oman, as well as the Palestinian Authority, which also supported the Saudi critique of the arms sale termination that Margot Wallstrom was calling for. Now, why does this have to do with masculinities? A couple of things. First of all, one really does have to do a feminist analysis of masculinization to know how this is playing out in Sweden. One has to really look at the Social Democratic Party. Their main organized base in Sweden are the labor unions. The labor unions have also come out against Wallstrom because they said it will jeopardize their jobs. A lot of women work in the defense industry in every country. Right? As some of you know, if you go into any weapons manufacturing installation, any big weapons uh, defense factory, where will you find the most women? Think about the, the making of a fighter jet or the making of any large weapons system. Where do you think, knowing what you know about the gender division of labor in industry, where are you, which department are you most likely to find the highest concentration of women? Assembly line. assembly line, it depends what you're assembling. Ah, now, but push further, because you're thinking electronics. I know you're thinking electronics. Of course you're thinking electronics. And that's where you'll find women, right? That is, in ev every, see, you were right all along. It, that more and more weaponry today is dependent on electronic assembly. Right? It's not like World War II where it's dependent on welders and riveters. It's dependent on electronic assembly. Electronic assembly is one of the most feminized parts of contemporary industrial assembly. So yes, there are women in Saab making jet fighter planes. But for the most part, well, you're doing a gender analysis now. For the most part, a disproportionate percentage of all employees who depend on defense contracts in Sweden 
are the way they are in the United States, in Belgium, in Russia, in um, Britain, in France, in Germany. That is, they, they, they are masculinized jobs. So yes, there are women, and you have to be really interested, there are women in defense industries in Sweden. But the disproportionate percentage of all people who depend on defense contract jobs are men. Secondly, they are unionized. This is Sweden, mind you. What percentage of all American workers are members of unions these days? 11, 11 percent, uh, dropping by the day. Um, in Sweden, though, labor unions are still very powerful politically, and that is the base of the Social Democratic Party that's now in power. That is the center-left party. It's dependent on the labor unions. The labor unions think the leadership is masculinized, and the leadership thinks that all workers in Sweden will lose if Sweden loses its military contracts. So yes, you have to be interested in masculinization, whether it be masculinization of a particular industry, or masculinization of a political party, or masculinization of labor unions, of executives. You have to be interested. But you're interested in it because you're interested in the workings of patriarchy. Right? You're interested in it because you're trying to make sense of how the gender power system works in a way that marginalizes most women and doesn't privilege all men, but privileges most men relative to most women. That is, be interested in masculinities. And they're very diverse, and they're usually in rivalries with each other. Be interested in masculinities, but be interested in masculinities because you're asking feminist questions about the workings of culture, the workings of organizations, and the workings of power. Don't be deflected by a patriarchal lure into being taken more seriously if you will just stop being so interested in women. Because that is the lure. I mean, patriarchy, in all its diverse, subtle, sophisticated, postmodern ways, is very alluring. It is very seductive. It is very rewarding. And it is very rewarding not only of men, but of some women in certain circumstances. So that when you hear people trying to say that masculinities deserve a lot more attention, say, for the explanation of what? And what you're listening for, whether they put it in exactly these terms or not, are people who are doing the funding, who are doing the supervision of research, who are the editors calling for certain kinds of stories, are UN agency people, foreign ministry, or State Department people, USIA aid people, are they interested in masculinities because they really want to investigate the ways in which male privileging works to sustain patriarchy? If there's a hint that they are encouraging you to be no longer interested in women or girls because they're just not to be taken so seriously, then all your antennae should go up, but you should have a response. Watch Sweden, not because Sweden is a major power in the world. Watch Sweden, not because you're all of a sudden going to be Scandinavian specialists, but watch Sweden because Margot Wallström has been one of the first ministers of any government to say, actually, we're going to try and implement a feminist foreign policy. And a feminist foreign policy she and Swedish feminists who she works with says is the following. A feminist foreign policy prioritizes the pursuit of sustainable development. It prioritizes the pursuit of sustainable peace. It prioritizes the implementation of human rights 
and it always, always, always sees all three of those things as dependent on the implementation of women's rights. Thanks. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, we will see you at 9 o'clock in the morning for the second day of our third annual conference here at the Center for the Study of Gender and Conflict. And just again to thank Cynthia Enlis so much. Long may your feminist curiosity thrive and continue to inspire us. Thank you.